being able to ask uh, this amazing panel of speakers lots of questions I've wanted to ask them and the fact that the Service Design Finch Festival has managed to bring them all together is amazing. So I've left at the opportunity. I think um, as a service designer and having practiced as a service designer for a few, quite a few years now, um, I've realized that uh, at the end of the day, in the world of service design, we like to solve problems. Um, and often when we think about the kinds of problems we like to solve, we like to, so we like to solve better problems. And I think that's a very um, reason for all of us to come together, even on a day like today, to really try and understand what are those problems worth solving and where we could really take it from here. I think at the end of the day, um, a lot of us in London, and I know you've, you've joined us from lots of different places, so I'm sure the kinds of problems you solve are different. But uh, some of us in London and a lot of us in the UK find ourselves solving only one kind of problem. And I have always had a problem with that. And I've said problem about five times in that sentence. Um, the reason I have a, I, I often uh, worry about the state of service design is because we only solve digital problems. And I have a feeling that there are bigger, better, and other problems to solve. And I think um, the joyful bit about this festival, putting together a panel on prototyping place, on really trying to understand how we design for social and spatial equity, um, it, it begins to shift the dial on the kinds of uh, concerns we want to grapple with as citizens, as residents, as travelers in cities, and really try and understand uh, the scale of the impact that we can have together. And I think to see this community, um, engage in a conversation like this is very heartwarming. Um, in my day job, I'm the service design principal at a consultancy called IDN, uh, which is a part of Capgemini. Uh, and in my non-day job, I run a think tank on understanding how we can make cities equitable and equal for everyone. I'm joined today uh, by Nina uh, Timmers from Participatory Cities. Um, when I was talking to Nina earlier, Nina was telling me a little about how she likes to effectively give agency to people and allow people to effectively become part and be owners of the problems that one tries to solve. Um, you'll see me reading off my laptop that's sitting on the side. I'm, I promise I'm not cheating, I just tell you I am. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, these notes are going to help me to make sure I can introduce people well. Um, what Nina also talked to me about was large-scale participation that she really enjoys uh, bringing in and effectively helping people build and shape places they like to live in. Nina, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we also have Liam Dalton. Uh, I hope I've pronounced your name right. Um, Liam works at Connected Places Catapult. Um, Liam has actually done something I wish all of us could do. Uh, I'm so, so envious of what you've managed to do. Liam, with having saved a marketplace from effectively being bulldozed. And that's pretty noble. Uh, I'd love to know more about it. You've been an advocate for people in local business and also for young people to be entrepreneurs. And you know, there's a lot for us to talk about today. Um, and last but not the least, we've got Jez Sweetland from the Bristol Housing Festival. Thank you for joining us, Jez. Um, I think your, your sheer focus on effectively thinking about housing as a problem that needs to be solved, but not by building more houses, but by actually engaging with people is um, truly inspiring. Um, I can't wait to hear more about what you share with us today. And so without me talking anymore, let me hand over to the people who actually know what they're talking about. I'll move over to Nina. Um, the screen's yours to share. All right. So thanks for the thanks for the lovely introduction, Pia. Um And as um, Pia said, I'm, I'll be talking about everyone every day today, uh, which is a initiative from Participatory City Foundation um, in working in Dagenham, um, East London. Um, I joined that uh, Participatory City Foundation about two and a half years ago. Um, I have a background in service and um, organization design. Uh, yeah, some of you might have seen me before at um, Service Design Fringe Festivals at FutureGov. Um, and I just wanted to say I'm so incredibly excited to be a part of this panel today um, and to among such you know, brilliant speakers and, and projects. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation. So I thought there, there were three things that I wanted to talk to you guys about today. Um, the first one is really just about like what are participatory cities and why are they so 
incredibly important, especially now. Um, the second thing is about design processes and methodologies that we use. Just a bit, little bit of a reflection on that because um, as Payal rightly pointed out, as you know, the service design community, we love our toolkits. So I thought I'd just touch upon some of the, some of the things that we use and that we find useful. Um, and then obviously the last one is what now, what's next? Because we're in the middle of a pandemic. No, you know, there's no moving around that. So we've really had to pivot what we do. And, and I'd love to share some thoughts on that um, with you guys. Um, so participatory cities, what are they and why are they so important? I think they really like they're, they build on this very simple idea that all of us, every single one of us are creative thinkers and doers. And I think this idea is so, it's very simple, but it's very important, especially now, because we face this set of interconnected global problems that are just too complex to solve by any single one of us. And yet, um, often it can be so hard to know where to start or, you know, to find each other. Um, and so that's really sort of like, that idea is at the basis of what, why participatory cities are important, because what they try to do is to um, create neighborhoods that have support structures in place to enable every one of us um, to do something together as citizens. Um, and I can imagine that you're wondering what that looks like. And so I just wanted to talk you through what that looks like in practice a little bit. Um, so it looks like, for example, having community spaces nearby where you live, not further than maybe 10 minutes walking away, um, where you will always be welcome, like no matter how much time or energy you have, um, you know, or whether you've got kids, for example, or, you know, no matter where you're coming from, you'll always be, always be welcome and they're always inviting um, um, and, you know, welcoming spaces. Um, and in those spaces, you can meet other people that maybe live close to where you live or, you know, people that you've, that you've met before, your neighbors, other people that you haven't, you haven't met before, different people. And also you can meet project designers, um, people that work for everyone every day and that help you really get your ideas, bring your ideas to life really quickly and help you, um, you know, think about how you can get started on things or, you know, who else might be interested in similar things that you are interested in and who you can connect with near where you live. Um, and some of those projects that they can help you start are, for example, around sharing and mending stuff like, you know, um, being able to upcycle your clothing or repair it or having access to sewing machines and having access to neighbors who are willing to teach you how to use them. Um, or even taking that a step further, maybe it's about having access to um, ma uh, machines that allow you to download open source patterns from the internet that help you create your own designs using all sorts of like sustainable materials. Um, it could also look like, you know, making it really easy to make streets safe for kids to come out and play and for neighbors to come out and share food or like meet each other and, you know, just making that a lot easier than it might be at the moment. Or it could also look pretty like that support structure could also look like, um, you know, make it incredibly easy to um, share leftovers or share food uh, through, for example, an open fridge network or, you know, having access to neighbors who are willing and able to teach you how to do composting so that you don't just throw away your stuff, but you know what to do with it. Um, it could be like, you know, coming together and building planters, um, having access to allotments, growing food and vegetables. Um, and even sometimes it looks like maybe having chickens together, um, sharing, you know, looking after them together with your neighbors or looking after bees together. Um, you know, it could be all sorts of things. But basically all of these projects are practical, hands-on um, participatory type projects um, that, you know, happen with embarking in Dagenham. Um, and so what, we, what we're really asking ourselves in Barking and Dagenham with everyone every day is how to do this on a borough-wide scale. And um, I think that's such an important point to make because all of these projects, as you might've seen, are not necessarily, you know, new or innovative. Like people have been sharing food for ages. People have been coming together to do and make and repair and, you know, um, uh, upcycle or, or, or do all sorts of things together for, for ages. But the thing that hasn't really happened yet, or the thing that often is quite difficult is to do this um, or at a large enough scale over a long enough period, because quite often these projects are dependent on sort of like one community superhero who drives all of it or someone in, in the local authority who really like gets it. And the moment that that person falls away, um, usually the project stops. And so the thing that we're asking ourselves with everyone every day is how, like, what does it take to scale this up to a borough wide scale? In other words, we're asking ourselves how to design and build the physical, technical and social infrastructure to enable us to co-create a sustainable future with our own two hands with everyone. Um, and the way that we're testing that question, the way that we're, um, that we're looking at that question is through um, using a model that basically has two elements. 
<clears throat> um, the first element is, oh, yeah. The first element is the support platform and the second one is the participatory ecosystem. Um, so the support platform really is, is um, sort of like three, three elements. It's a bunch of community spaces across the borough, which is really important because like I said before, it should, it should be close to people's homes. People aren't going to take a 20 minute bus ride to you know, share a meal together. Um, so we need to be spread out across the borough. It's a physical spaces that are inviting and welcoming. It's a, it's a team uh, and the biggest part of our team are called the neighborhood team, which are interacting with residents on a daily basis. Um, and really like, you know, having those project designer skills to help people think about where to get started, how to get started, connecting them into the network. And then we have a, a whole bunch of operations and logistics stuff like accredited training, just really to lower the risk for people um, to start projects or to get going. Like, to share that risk and make it easier for people to do something. And all of this support system is in place to try and grow a participatory ecosystem um, as big as the whole of Parking and Dagenham. And what we mean with a participatory ecosystem is just basically a network of projects and people. Um, and I can imagine that that's still a bit vague. So I just wanted to highlight some of the food projects that have been happening just to try and explain a little bit what we mean with a network or an ecosystem of projects and people. Um, so just to give you an example, like food is, food is an incredibly, you know, popular topic in, in the borough and something that people are very passionate about. There's lots of different cultures and it's often a part of people's identity and, and people are quite passionate about it. Um, and so one of the most um, popular projects is called Great Cook and it's a very, very simple um, concept. I don't think it wasn't even invented by us. It came from somewhere else. It's, um, it's very simple. Someone has a recipe that they want to share, something that they love cooking. Uh, everybody else brings one ingredient and together you cook, you might learn that recipe, but, you, but the other thing is as well that you take home batches of, of, of cooked food. Um, but one of the things that we found out through this project or one of the things that emerged is that not everyone is as confident as others in the kitchen. And so some people were really keen to just learn some basic basic, um, basically skills, not even basic recipes, but maybe some skills around, for example, this one, eggs and spot. So we, another project that sort of came, you know, was developed on the back of some of those insights or uh, together with residents is, was Starter Kitchen, where people were just sharing and, and, and sort of learning um, basic um, cooking skills together. And then another project that sort of came, came about from Great Cook is um, a project called eat and cook where people said actually you know what I love I love that I've learned this recipe I've loved that we've we've cooked it food together but what I'd really like to do is really then also eat it together and get to know each other a bit better so again that was sort of like an iteration of one of those projects that um, came out from from sort of a great cook and some of the some of the interests in food and cooking in, in the area and then even other residents said that, you know what I'd be really interested in in actually professionalizing my the, the food products that I'm making and and maybe joining one of the collaborative business programs and um, prototyping it, getting some, some information and, and expert advice on how to um, prolong the shelf life and really get to, to test sell my product at a market. So here you see um, one of the first groups um, who, who traded under the collaborative brand Pentry, some of the products that they basically prototyped in about, prototyped in about eight weeks time. And I think that sort of shows you, I hope it shows you a little bit what we mean with sort of like an ecosystem of projects and people. Like all of these projects, you know, they start somewhere, they as some might pause at some point, they develop into something else, all based around what people are interested in doing and what they want to do. And people could be entering, um, you know, that participation ecosystem at any given point at any different stage. Um, and so it really is an ecosystem in that sense. It's sort of like a living and growing and changing thing because you know, those projects might stop at some point or change or, or, or grow or, or continue in different ways. Um, and just to as well make the point that people really enter that ecosystem at different points in time. Some people might have less time and confidence and really just connect on social media or pop into the shops or like, you know, participate in something and others are ready to host or, or replicate a project um, in another location. And others are even more interested in like collaborative brand programs or, you know, setting up co-ops. Um, this isn't a linear thing, though, like people might start out doing a collaborative brand program, but then actually, you know, something might happen in their lives and they end up participating um, in the second year or whenever. And all of that is fine. Um, that's how the ecosystem is designed for people to be able to move in and out of it, basically. Um, so I thought I would share some of our design process and methodologies. Um, I obviously can't share all of it and I, I sort of picked the two that I thought would be most provoking and most interesting. Um, the first one is really sort of like a comparison between the participatory project design process and service or product design processes. Um, 
to provoke a little bit, I guess, but also to show how it really is in essence sort of different. Um, and then the second thing I thought I'd highlight is developmental evaluation, because that's one of the most important mo you know, approaches that we use in order to sort of evaluate and, and develop what we do. So first of all, I wanted to say like, please bear with me. I know this isn't as black and white as I've put it down on this slide. Uh, I know that you know, everyone has their own processes and service. there's not one service design process, I know that, but roughly speaking, I just wanted to highlight some of the ways in, in which it works, where you know, it follows some form of like double diamond where we identify a problem or, or an opportunity. Um, uh, we do a lot of research, we try and understand what's happening. We might you know, generate ideas to try and, try and resolve that, select some of the best ideas and then start prototyping them or implementing them straight away. Um, and I think the participatory design projects design process is different because it starts with more of like a big vision for, for a place. Um, and it then maps all of the different resources that might already exist in that place, such as people and skills and spaces and organizations and anything that sort of like could, could contribute to, to that vision. Um, and it then tries to design many different projects using all of those different resources and it then executes them, which, um, which is again, what sort of creates that ecosystem of, of um, projects uh, and people. And I think the main difference between these two is sort of the role of the user or the role of people. Whereas in service design, quite often there, you know, there's a, there's a big um, part for them to play in the user research, maybe some co-design. And then, you know, at the end, obviously they're the user of the service or the product. Whereas in participatory projects, design processes, they're a part of, um, you know, they sort of, they're a part of the whole process. They co-design those projects, but most importantly, I think they co-produce the, the actual things once they're happening. Um, and they own parts of it as well, and they get to, they get to have a say about where things go or what, what things um, should be developed next. Um, and so one of the ways in which that the project designers sort of curate that ecosystem of, of projects is by um, really, you know, sort of adhering to these 14 design principles that we, that one of the main goals that these principles have is to um, ensure that the participatory ecosystem is inclusive. And just to give you an example, all of the activities that and, and projects that are co-designed are basically are open to anyone. So we don't target or there's no, you know, no sort of like um, exclusive things, even if it's, for example, um, you know, a storybook session, which is about storytelling and, and, and making stuff, then anyone could, could actually come to that session. Um, uh, and so that's, that's the case for all of those, all of those sessions. Some of the other principles are, for example, around um, it should only ever require load time and commitment. It should be at no cost where possible or very low cost, like I said before, like maybe, I don't know, you need to bring two onions or something. Um, and also it should be nearby and accessible. Like I said, every, everyone should be able to walk, you know, walk to um, a community space or, or an activity happening in a mini hub that we've sort of built connections with. Um, in order to be able to do it, because otherwise people just aren't going to come. Um, so that's really important. These design principles are really about making sure that it's as inclusive as possible. Um, and so the second thing is developmental evaluation, the second sort of like approach that we, um, that I thought I'd highlight, um, because it's, it's quite important and it's really how we, it's, it's, it's how we sort of look at how we develop the, the program, if you will. Um, so, but, may, you, I mean, you, you will probably be familiar with this, but there's, but there's roughly three major evaluation approaches to use, developmental, formative and summative. Developmental really asks, well, what is this? Formative asks, how is it working? So this is for when something is up and running a little bit and you might be improving things, you might reflect on it in order to be able to sort of like adapt it and improve it and enhance it. And then there's summative evaluation, which looks at, look, we've designed this thing, we've delivered it, has it done what it was designed to deliver? And obviously with everyone every day, because we're designing something and developing something that hasn't been done yet at this scale. And we're asking ourselves, what will it take to reach this borough wide scale? We're using a developmental evaluation approach. Um, and what that means in practice is, for example, that everyone, every single person in the, um, in the everyone every day team is a researcher and everyone is involved in gathering and sharing data on a daily basis. Um, and we've got very regular moments like, um, team day every week or um, developmental evaluation camp three times a year uh, in which we sort of try to analyze and codify um, sort of insights to inform the next bit of what we're going to do. Um, and so the last bit, what now, what's next? I think um, because, you know, like obviously we're in the business of bringing people together and with COVID that isn't really something that's very easy or safe to do. So we've really had to think about what we do and how we can 
um, you know, what, like how we can still help people, you know, build on those relationships that they have or, or do things that are, that are valuable or have a, have a sense of agency around where they live and, and, and what they can do. Um, and I mean, I, I found this, this visual, which I thought was quite funny because we, we put this on our website on Friday, the 13th of March, because we were um, closing all of our shops. And obviously, as you can see, we apparently thought that maybe by the 30th of March, this would be over, <laughs> which, which clearly it isn't. Um, but um, I think, yeah, one of the first things that we did is we, we, in March, we were in the middle of our spring program with hundreds of activities planned and lots of people being really excited about like getting their projects started. And so we've tried to um, pull as many as possible of those sort of events and, and sessions and projects online. Um, and even though we've had like um, quite a lively community initially, um, you know, obviously we're not reaching everyone um, because not everyone is interested or able to go online. Um, and so another thing that we've done is we've started something called Tomorrow Today Streets, which is really about um, packaging up some of the projects that um, that we know work well or that, you know, are quite popular in, in starter kits that people can um, take into their street and really to enable people to start those projects with their neighbors where they live. So, so this, this really builds on the sort of like newfound neighborliness that we've seen during lockdown with lots of mutual aid groups popping up and people having a having a renewed sense of like how important it is to under to know where you to sort of like know your neighbors to have a different view of like where you live in a very local way um and i guess this one is is really interesting as well because again we use a developmental evaluation process but for this one i would say it's even more um premature than that it's more of a design if, evaluation process if you will because we're literally designing this as we go and trying to figure it out together with people who are applying in order to make sure that it works for them but what is interesting is that we have actually had over 80 applications so far already so you can see that there is an appetite for people to still feel like they you know they they can do something and they can connect to their neighbors and there there is an appetite to think about what we can do and how we can shape um you know even on a very local level um this the places that we live in um and so yeah i think i'm really i mean i'm really excited about this project because it's yeah it's it's really showing you know those applications those numbers show that there's an appetite for it, but it's, it's a real challenge as well but i think it's a real a way to add value in these sort of like fairly difficult times um for people so the, what i wanted to end on like a final thought which is that um i truly believe like we truly believe that pr practical participation infrastructure is basically public social infrastructure in the same way as libraries roads and parks are um, and I wanted to end on this thought because I feel like this is even more important now. Like we need to find ways to enable people to have a sense of agency to participate actively in shaping where they live and what they can do. I think that's so important, especially if we're coming, you know, if we're coming out of whatever, whatever that might mean, um, this pandemic and, and when we're rebuilding things and if we're, you know, like thinking about what, what, we, what we do next and how we do that together. Um, so yeah, as I said, I think that's even more important now. And I think the question that I wanted to ask, um, you is like, what do you, what do you, as a service design community or people that are interested in it, what do you think could be the role of service designers in making this happen or contributing to it? Um, so yeah, I'm super curious to hear your thoughts. Um, but that, yeah, that was it. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think, um, so you've got a you've got a chat function open. If you've got ideas of what service designers could be doing um, to solve for problems of tomorrow, um, and just start thinking about what a role of a service designer in a, in such a situation could be, that would be wonderful to know. It will also give me enough to riff off as I move on uh, to really starting to think about the kinds of questions I'd love to ask Nina. If you've got questions you'd like to ask Nina, hold them. Make sure you write it down so you don't forget it in about two speakers from now and uh, we'll open up the chat function towards the end of the panel, uh, towards the end of all speakers having presented for you to then fire those questions off for me to pick from. On that note, um, I'm going to move on to Liam. Uh, Liam, are you good to share your screen? Uh, yeah, let's give it a go. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm Liam. Uh, I'm a service designer at the Connected Places Catapult. Um, that's me. Um, so I care about using uh, good design to create better places for a fair society. Um, 
essentially I, I use my skills and expertise in uh, user-centered design to create experiences and places uh, that are meaningful, sustainable and fair. Um, I'm presuming that I'm speaking to an audience um, who consider themselves either to be service designers or interested in service design. Um, and so I want to talk about our role as service designers or designers in general, um, informing the places that we live and we come from. So when I talk about places, um, this could literally just be your street or um, a space or a park that you care about, for example. Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a physical space in the real world. Um, but I guess my question is, how can we, um, as a designer or not, help to activate better, fairer and more sustainable places? And I think that now is a perfect time to be thinking about this. Um, as Nina mentioned, um, kind of COVID has allowed us to kind of rethink so much. Um, and I think that it's allowed us to rethink what we value. So I kind of ask you, um, what have you missed uh, during lockdown? Um, what do you want to protect? What do you want to make sure is still there? Um, or even what's changed during lockdown for the good that you'd like to keep that way? So I'll tell you a little bit about um, my role at the Catapult in a little bit, but I'm gonna start off by talking about um, a particular project that I worked on a few years ago. Um, so I've always been interested in my community, um, wherever I've lived, uh, whether that be in Tooting, London, where I live now, uh, or in my hometown of Darwin in Lancashire. Uh, this curiosity has uh, driven me to make places, uh, sorry, no, this curiosity and drive to make better places uh, led me to this project that I'm about to share with you, um, which I did before joining the Catapult. So some context. Dolan is a market town in the northwest of England uh, with a population of around 30,000 people. Um, part of Blackburn with Dolan Borough Council, uh, the town has an impressive history and proud people, uh, whether that be related to our role in the Industrial Revolution, in the early days of professional football, as seen in a recent Netflix series, um, or the Tower on the Moors, which has proudly sat looking over Lancashire since 1898. However, the town and the borough faces many challenges, uh, just like others around the country, um, with life expectancy, deprivation, and education being uh, on average worse than the national average. And so in particular, I want to speak about Darwin Markets, um, which you've been able to see on your screen for the past minute or so. It's made up of two market buildings, uh, the Victorian five-day market and the three-day market, which was the kind of hexagonal uh, building that you could see. So back in 2016, uh, at university, missing home, uh, I decided to spend a week at, uh, at the markets, interviewing, filming, and photographing the traders, market managers, and customers to understand essentially just a day in the life of Darwin Markets and the challenges that they faced. Let's listen to what the people want. Advertising, advertising, advertising. This is what we need. A stall holder is in an entity like the market, they expect uh, the management or someone else to um, you know, take responsibility for promoting themselves and promoting the business. The market sets in its ways and the hours are totally not in line with everybody else. If it's not used, you will lose it, it will go. And you know what, she was right. Following a decline in customer footfall and new traders, uh, and facing two buildings in need of repair, Blackburn with Darwin Council made the decision to demolish the three-day market building and consolidate Darwin's two markets into the one Victorian building. So with the spare building being marked for demolition, uh, the council and community were faced with two questions. Um, what should this new space in the heart of town become? But also how can we resolve footfall issues and help the community to fall in love with their market and town centre once again. Um, I think what I came to realise uh, later on uh, is that the second question is the most important and that it should inform the first one. Um, so with limited public consultations having taken place and the community left in uncertainty, I made the opportunity to present my research so far to the Darwin Town Centre Partnership Board and Council and beyond that, showed them some ideas 
about what they could do next around community engagement. And this is where I introduced Heart of Darwin. So this is where I use my design skills, having been uh, currently on a, a graphic design degree um, at university in Kingston. Uh, so I created Heart of Darwin, um, a platform to support community engagement by encouraging and inspiring idea generation and debates uh, within the community around the future of Darwin's market and town center and all of the community uh, engagement activities um, online and offline uh, were presented uh, under this Heart of Darwin brand. And so in collaboration with the council, um, we held a variety of engagement activities in Darwin, um, including the market trade workshop, visits to local schools and stands at local events. Uh, and these physical activities were supported with online engagement through social media uh, and the Heart of Darwin website. Um, and then, uh, and this is where I feel like Heart of Darwin uh, started to go kind of beyond what you might expect from a normal consultation. Um, after it was invited to take part in Manufactory, um, which was an event organized by uh, Kieran O'Connor, who's also on his call actually, uh, an incredible event which took place during the London Design Festival at Old Spitalfields Market um, with the aim of exploring the futures of markets and commerce. So um, I secured the funding uh, to bring 20 Darwin residents to London, where we then toured the event and nearby markets and retail spaces. Uh, before holding an afternoon workshop seeking to generate ideas that could be applied in Darwin. It's worth bearing in mind that we had a real mixture of people as well, and some of those people had never been to London um, or even had never even been out of Lancashire, so it was a real experience for people. Um, we facilitated various activities, uh, first the aim to understand how participants currently perceive their town. Um, we then asked them to tell us what success would look like um, by writing ideal headlines. And we then moved into ideas. And this was one of my favorite activities that we did actually, um, idea generation, where, where we kind of brought two unexpected elements of Darwin together and created ideas around that. So um, some of them were more expected than others, but for example, market plus nightlife, what ideas would have, uh, could you create when those two things are brought together? And then with that and other ideation activities um, that, uh, resulted in us uh, prioritizing uh, a set of ideas. Um, and then we also wanted to deal with the relationship between stakeholders around the table. So um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the uh, relationship between the community and council can be quite frosty at times. So I think by bringing all of these people together to experience something together uh, on the same level, nobody wearing suits, everybody kind of uh, less formal, uh, we were able to understand uh, what was expected from each other. And so Darwin has since seen through the redevelopment of the old market space into an open and adaptable square uh, designed to host various events throughout the year. Um, and various changes started to be made inside the market itself, aiming to increase footfall and a variety of traders. Um, but place doesn't stop at space. Um, if we look back at our two questions, um, number two still hadn't necessarily been answered. Uh, admittedly, this isn't the kind of question that you can that can be solved easily with one solution, uh, but rather uh, as seen in the ideas of the Heart of Dawn workshop, uh, lots and lots of ideas over a long period of time. So one of the challenges we heard about was businesses not accepting card payments. Um, this was due to the perception of card payments being too expensive um, or uh, complicated. Um, but with global trends showing that shoppers are carrying around cash less often, uh, I thought it was important to try and solve this issue. And so that's when I approached Square, um, knowing that back then, whilst they were a big player in the US, um, they were fairly new to the UK at the time. Um, they agreed to collaborate with Heart of Darwin to help bring digital payments to the town. And every local business in Darwin can now pick up a free digital card reader, usually worth around 60 pounds. And they can also take 1000 pounds worth of card payments completely fee free. Um, and that gives them a real um, incentive to kind of at least give it a try. Um, uh, in the first few months, over, over 30 independent businesses signed up, uh, primarily in the market. Um, and within the first few months, they transacted around £50,000. 
um, with the majority of them being inside the market. Sorry, I've already said that. Um, as well as the technology, uh, Square also provided training and marketing support to increase digital literacy uh, and ensure nothing could get in the way of a smooth setup. So it's fair to say that Darwin still has a long way to go. Um, and actually, I haven't really looked at I haven't really looked at this project for the past two years. Um, so looking back on it now, um, knowing now what I what I've learned since, uh, there's certainly a lot of things that I would do differently or build upon. For anyone who'd like to take a proactive approach uh, approach in improving that area, um, here's a few learnings that I have. So first of all, um, there's always some less obvious stakeholders that you should be learning from and getting on board. Um, so map out your stakeholders. It can be difficult, but I would say that uh, we did it fairly well, um, but could perhaps have done more to engage, for example, with those who currently are not using the market. Um, make representation a priority. So it's not a nice to have, uh, but it is crucial to ensuring community get on board, gain benefits and feel ownership of the place. Um, this is definitely something we could have done better. Uh, and one thing to, uh, to do, uh, one way to do this is to meet them where they are, um, rather than expecting them to go out of their way to engage. Um, be transparent and share everything. So this is really important. Um, and I think it's something um, that we could have been better at. Um, for example, sharing workshop findings makes people much more likely to contribute again, um, but it also helps those people who are unable to attend to stay involved. Um, remain a middleman where you can. So <laughs> this can be really tricky, uh, but try to stay unbiased. Um, otherwise you'll end up getting an angry phone call from uh, one of the market traders blaming you and you alone for the decision to demolish the market. Um, educate and alter perceptions. So one thing that we did really well, I think, with the trip to London and manufacturing was taking Darwiners out of their context um, and it allows them to see new things, think outside of the box, uh, but it also removes hierarchy within, within the group. Um, it's also important to not do this kind of thing alone. Um, educate others, ask for help, and then when you're not in, uh, when you're not there, the hard work doesn't stop. Um, beyond bricks and mortar, so it's easy to focus on how things look, um, but when you understand the challenges that need solving, it becomes much more fun and important to work out ways uh, to solve them beyond how a place looks. Um, plant pots and paving stones are secondary. Um, some of the most thriving markets I've seen um, are that a bit, uh, have, have been the ugliest buildings ever. Um, and I guess this leads me to my next learning, which is um, think of your place as a service. So once you start to think beyond bricks and mortar, um, you can start to understand your place as a service. Um, one thing I would also have liked to spend more time doing um, was thinking about how Heart of Darwin could have been a more effective service in itself. Um, I know what you're aiming for. So it's fair to say that much of what Heart of Darwin did was quite reactive. Um, at the time I was a student and um, what I look back on now and realize is a lot of what I was doing was, could be, could be uh, framed as service design. Um, but back then I didn't realize that I was um, a service designer to be. Um, but now I appreciate the power of getting together and creating a plan. So um, this doesn't need to be too detailed, um, but agreeing principles, aims, expectations, and next steps is a great way to add purpose to your actions and helps the rest of the community to understand what role they need to play. Uh, and if you do want to do something a little more formal, in the UK there is neighbourhood planning, uh, which is like a, an initiative set up by the government, which is a great way to, to formalise that. Um, also measure your progress from the start. So it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, um, but something I wish I'd done more uh, was thinking about measuring impact and tracking progress from the start. Um, if you want to apply for funding uh, and things like that, um, having stats, photographs and evidence of change can go a long way. And then finally, there's making use of existing resources. So make the most of your local councillors and MPs. Local community organisations and networks can introduce you to a lot of people. There's actually quite a lot of funding pots available, um, especially for these kind of projects. And there's also community crowdfunding uh, space hive. Uh, also learn from other similar initiatives and frameworks. 
Uh, there's also government initiatives such as community rights to bid, neighborhood planning and land ownership, but also there's free online resources of knowledge and tools such as things like the High Street Task Force, Act Build Change, and of course, Participatory City. So those are my learnings from Heart of Darwin. Um, whilst there are things I wish I'd done differently or, um, or that I've learned about now, uh, starting a community movement which resulted in the council taking action uh, still kind of gives me butterflies in my tummy now when I think about it. Um, having, having said that, it's fair to say that um, it shouldn't just be up to individuals to make change. Um, councils, government, landowners, developers, uh, it's fair to say that community consultation can be seen as a bit of a barrier, a tick box activity, um, but opening up to genuine engagement, co-design uh, to your communities brings enormous benefit. There's actually commercial value um, that comes with involving your communities from the start and throughout. You're more likely to get them on board and end up with the correct solution. And you can also upskill them as you're doing it as well. So there's many towns in the UK um, with high street funding or towns funding, including Darwin at the moment. And so I beg these places to open up your communities, be led by challenges and be open to experimentation. Since working on Heart of Darwin, I've continued to work towards making better places uh, as part of my role at the Catapult. In particular, I want to speak about one project uh, in a moment where cities have taken an alternative approach to citizen engagement. So the Connected Places Catapult is the National Centre of Excellence for Technologies, Placemaking, Transport and Mobility, aiming to transform the UK's innovation capabilities. Um, we help SMEs, towns and cities to tackle some of the biggest challenges that we face. And we're also one of uh, nine different catapults across the country that focus in different areas. So I'm part of the Insight and Service Design team, um, and I'm lucky to be surrounded by some incredible service designers and user, and user researchers. But within the catapult, it's our role to put society and community at the centre of what we do. So we apply our research and design skills to projects and covering unique insights and designing new place-based services. Uh, and we work on projects of varying scales, um, collaborating across the catapult, solving challenges in the UK and around the world. Um, here's a few examples of the kind of projects that we might that you might expect us to do in our team. So for example, I've just started a project working with historical European cities to co-design entrepreneurial innovation hubs. Uh, we've also worked with Westminster City Council to engage local stakeholders and create an action plan for local business participation in the pedestrianising in the pedestrianisation of the Strand in Oldwich. Um, or let me think of another one. Um, working with the government to discover the challenges associated with collecting and linking building safety information in response to the Grenfell tragedy. But I'm going to speak to you about one of the other projects, um, and that's. One of the main projects that I've worked on at the Catapult is Sharing Cities. So it's a major European Horizon 2020 um, Smart Cities project. Um, and I've worked with the, the cities of London, Lisbon and Milan uh, to help develop and implement and retain the digital social markets, which is a service framework um, which we kind of help to create, uh, which incentivizes citizen engagement and uh, aims to change perceptions and behaviours around some of the most pressing urban challenges, whether that be mobility, energy efficiency, uh, citizen engagement or sustainability. Um, so um, my team have worked with each city to utilise human-centred design techniques to create meaningful services. Uh, and our activities have kind of gone all ac across the whole spectrum of service design um, and user research, uh, whether that be service mapping, uh, community building, service prototyping, uh, creating guides and tools, developing communication strategies, graphic design, uh, UI design support based on UX research, event planning, managing relationships, uh, writing reports, and scaling up the project as well. Um, just to say as well, there's uh, quite a few uh, playbooks available currently uh, on this project. Um, and they're available to find on the Sharing Cities website. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about one of the solutions. So in Milan, uh, the platform that we created allows users to earn re rewards for their sharing, uh, for sharing their sustainable actions. Uh, and these can be spent in local businesses around Milan. 
Uh, the city and other partners can host challenges uh, which encourage particular activities um, that are kind of related to city challenges, whether that be around plastic waste or, or cycling to work um, or even around loneliness at home. Um, the platform now has around 2,000 users uh, with nearly 6,000 stories shared. So I want you to think again, what have you missed? What do you want to protect? How can you make a positive change in the areas that you care about? If you want to learn a little bit more about the Catapult, um, we have a series of uh, excellent podcasts available to listen uh, on uh, your usual kind of podcast providers. It's called Connected Places, uh, including one particular episode, episode four, which is around what now for cities and our city centers. Um, you can also find us on Medium for blogs discussing the built environment, mobility, leveling up and post-pandemic places. And you can also check out our events. Um, if you'd like to find out more about me or my team, uh, get in touch via email uh, on the screen or Twitter or LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to kind of answer any questions. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. If, if you could see me on the other side as you were closing down that screen, I was furiously writing a list of places I'd like to do something about. I, I realized yeah. that we we can all get very quickly complacent about the lives that we live and the things that we find comfortable and there's just so much around us to affect. So thank you for, for that very, very inspiring um, talk. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to Jez. Um, Jez, could, would, are you able to share your screen with us? Yes, I can. Firstly, thanks for those, those presentations and Pewa, thank you for, uh, I think just that in your opening, you mentioned that part of the challenge of the uh, the Fringe Festival here is reaching out to people who aren't service designers and uh, I'm going to be uh, very candid. I'm not a service designer. Um, my background is I'm a, uh, a trained and, and worked in corporate law. Um, sorry about that. And then left that and moved into the charity sector and um, then, then worked really as a chief exec in various organizations. And uh, about three years ago, uh, having left a particular job, had moved to Bristol with my, my, my quite young family at the time. Um, and have been just deeply impacted, I think, by the reality of the housing crisis uh, as a kind of just a human challenge, a social social cost, and and looking at the complexity um, of that challenge, but also full of hope and belief that uh, as we start, as you know, it, for those of you with any experience working in the built environment, um, we're, we're talking about really complex systems, but we're also talking about new technologies through through things called modern methods of construction. Uh, that potentially can be disruptive. So if we think about um, the places that we live and, and how we, we create homes and, and, and places for people that um, we, we really focus on three areas. So we have a housing crisis, which fundamentally is about um, land supply uh, and housing supply and affordability and, and, and those issues. Uh, then there's a climate crisis. So, so how do we now start to really engage uh, in the construction sector with building homes that are both sustainable in terms of the way that they're built, but also energy efficient in terms of uh, their function, their performance. And, and there's also actually construction skills crisis. So we, as the UK, the national government will talk about building 300,000 homes a year. One of the challenges is do we have a supply chain capable um, of, of actually delivering those kind of numbers and modern methods of construction where we're talking about moving the building of homes from a uh, sort of traditional brick and block in a field, um, in a muddy patch, uh, are moved into a more of a manufacturing process, so in a dry factory, and then they can be shipped to sites where they're incredibly tight, energy efficient, et cetera. So, so we, we went to the city, um, and we, we have an elected mayor in Bristol, and we kind of came up with this, he, he'd been elected, very much running on a ticket of, of housing, um, and we said, look, we, we need as a city to be able to have a discussion to change the narrative on housing. One of the big issues is this breakdown of trust between the developers, uh, between between communities, between the politicians, and what would it look like to to create a, a mechanism where we can start to re envision and dream together about our housing crisis as a city? Um, and of course, what is a housing festival? Uh, it's not a, two, a weekend of drinking together and just going around each other's houses. The idea was much more inspired by things like the Festival of Britain 1851, using festivals to kind of change the way that we think, to change the ways that we operate, to to model the art of the possible. Um, and we went to the mayor really with that kind of off to say, could we, could we as a city host a housing festival over five years? Um, and, that, and that really was the start of the conversation. And 
the vision around that was how do we really imagine better ways to live in our cities, principally around the place of, of, of housing and the need of housing, but recognizing that so much of the conversation about housing is not really about just units. It's about how we create places and communities, the politics of place. Uh, how can we start to do that? And with a mission of how can we, uh, if, if there is systemic failure and one of the, one of the sort of exam questions I suppose we posed ourselves is that when we talk about the, the, the market failure to deliver enough affordable homes um, in cities across the UK and actually across the world, how can we redesign and how can technology, the new ways of doing things and the new ways of creating collaborations and digital platforms, how can those things actually allow us to model new ways of doing things? That was the kind of uh, exam question we posed ourselves. And we said over five years, so the modeling was, let's create a think and do tank. So over five years, we have a, uh, a challenge to ourselves as a city to commission and fund new communities. So it's very much about um, learning to, to do these things in the real world. It's not just a concept. Um, but as we do that, how do we celebrate good news stories? So if, if any of you sort of notice in the press, what we tend to do is focus on the bad news stories. Uh, you know, most stories in the newspapers or in the media are around an incompetent local authority um, or a fairly cynical evil developer. It's very rare that we have space to celebrate when things have been done really well. Um, and actually trust has been built. So we wanted to create this festival notion where we could bring together, as I said, the, the public, um, the politicians, the industry, and we can get under some of the nuance and some of the complexity of this, but we can also have an umbrella to celebrate good news events in the city and have space to talk about the challenges. Housing is not black and white. Often it's about art of compromise and um, what are your priorities? How do you lead with shared objectives and get things done? And we talk, we've done a lot of this around um, the values that we think are really important to create trusted partnerships so around being united as a city. Courage is so important in innovation. Um, so often we would talk to other local authorities about the art of the possible and it's really difficult in a political cycle to really innovate and, uh, and the, the temptation is to say well let someone else go first. And one of the things we talked about was how can we help Bristol innovate and, and, and partner with the council in particular to bring land and to bring the opportunity to innovate, to be courageous, to go first. The spirit of generosity as a city so that we are uh, compassionate about the fact that actually we need to think differently and the kind of nimbyism um, that so often can be a challenge. How can we have a conversation to bypass and, and engage that process? And, and ultimately, we need to be hopeful. If the system can't change, then, then we all give up and we go home and we become cynical and despondent. But how can we create testimony and story about the art of the possible? Um, so so where we started this in uh, October 2018. We had a, a mayor who was very on side and was talking about how can we create uh, across the city a laboratory to test and, and model new ideas. And uh, at the same time, the mayor working throughout the city had come up with this concept called uh, Bristol One City. And it was a, a challenge really to say, how, do the, how does the governance of a city work? The, the, the council is one element of that, but actually, of course, you've got businesses, you've got the, the, the voluntary sector, you've got communities, you've got the, the, the broader public sector, the, um, the education, you know, there's, there are so many elements to a city. And, and actually to start to get some of the, the, the shared objectives, the shared purposes across those different elements of the city become really important and to have a shared narrative. Uh, and an ambitious plan to say, well, how and where does the city need to be by 2050? And one of the key elements, of course, to a city is its housing, its politics of place, where we belong, how we sit into a city, how we feel we have agency to contribute and be part of a place. Um, and one of the goals for 2050, which we love, is that everyone will live in an affordable home that meets their needs within a thriving and safe community. That is a big goal, um, and all the more so against the context of this climate crisis that we face, but I think it's the right kind of goal. And how do you then coalesce um, a whole city around that challenge, but also that opportunity? So we launched in 2018 with a, an expo, and we, uh, we coincided that with an event called the Global Parliament of Mayors. Um, so, so Bristol was, was visited by about, I think about 100 mayors from all over the world, which of course many people are sharing these same challenges. And we, we, we hosted an event where, um, we, we popped up, as it were, six modern methods homes on the waterfront. We had about 6,000 members of the public uh, come down and visit. Uh, so much of the innovation is also around socialization, explaining and demystifying what we're talking about when we're, we're, we're sort of engaging with new ideas. And that event was hugely, hugely successful in the sense that it created a, 
uh, a shared a bit of shared vision it created some momentum um, it created some political goodwill of course it's not universal there are always people that will be fearful and negative um, but on the whole it created a real opportunity for us to spring forward um, and start to talk about what 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 we would do together and and one of the things we've continued to do is to hold these roundtable events um, year one was very much about engaging the public year two has been creating a credibility and understanding with some of the industry um, talking about things like the social value act how do we really start to think about the value uh, of outcomes not just what things cost uh, which so often is an issue when we talk about particularly in the in housing and construction industry um, but but it was a think do tank and so we knew that we ultimately would be measured by um, could we actually get anything done in partnership and collaboration um, and uh, you know I think that that, that whilst we were at the beginning of that journey we're starting to see progress so Launchpad uh, is now up and built this was a partnership between a social housing provider Bristol University uh, the council um, a, a charity that works with people particularly young care leavers uh, and a whole host actually of other construction industry specialists and architects um, and, and, and the vision here was creating a 31 bed unit very quickly on a city council disused city council car park but but the challenge we always pose ourselves with the schemes we're looking at are that there's almost two exam questions one is how can we engage with modern methods and the second question is how can we create and foster community and so these look like um, uh, shipping containers they're not we, we we've been quite careful about the, the challenges that some of that can uh, create in terms of the, the living quality of the living space but uh, shipping containers are considered quite funky and so um, uh, there was a desire to sort of build them to look a bit like that and this is 31 um, homes uh, a mix of care leavers uh, who engaging through us with a charity key workers and also Bristol University students to create a mixed community and within that this complex there's actually quite a large communal area this notion of of one of the things that, that about place is this ability to mix and to be known and to have neighbors and to to do life with other people um, and so that is built. It's uh, we're starting to get feedback from that, but but that's been a, um, a a really interesting collaboration of bringing all those people together. And and certainly within um, one of the challenges of, of homelessness can be for people leaving care. It can be very very hard for them to get stable accommodation. That can be a, a cycle then of into homelessness and other challenges. So it's it's really important that we we look at some of the practical realities for people to get in, into secure homes. Um, this is another opportunity where we uh, we I remember going to a housing expo uh, future build in London and seeing for the first time a Z pod which I was a bit like this is a good idea why is this not happening um, and Z pods essentially are zero carbon homes um, where in theory you can build them um, above above existing car parks and not you lose any car parking space so we've got a lot of challenge in cities about the use of brownfield sites um, and bringing them back into better use and particularly the future of the car, you know, and how we're going to engage with the car. It's a real challenge for cities. So we, we, um, we were keen to try and develop the first or partner and collaborate with the first UK Z-Pod scheme above a car park. And pleased to say that that, sorry for the rubbish image at the bottom right, but that I literally took that this morning. Those, those are now uh, about up. We're going to have people moving into them um, at the end of October. Um, and we've, taken over this incredible location by, by, by a park. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the car parking is not lost. Now, interestingly, this is one of those examples where lots of people, and that's a good idea, who's done it before? Um, and there's something really difficult some, about going first, particularly when it's political, but when you've got neighbors concerned about it, when there's challenges about modern methods and, and how do you know it's um, gonna perform in the way it performs. But, but huge credit to a, a number um, of partners and in, obviously including the council but but the question again was how do we have a story that is good news for the city so 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 many of the people in the house in the city for example won't really care about how the house is built and that it's zero carbon or but what they'll care about is 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 the human stories um, that you know this sense of building hope and, and building opportunities and so we partnered on this scheme with the YMCA in Bristol and the YMCA in Bristol has a commercial backpackers hostel um, and eight of their rooms are given over to young people in housing crisis. But there's a, there's a challenge around move on accommodation. And so a lot of those young people have ended up uh, really being stuck in that, in that temporary accommodation and, and this desire that people have for a place, secure accommodation. So we, the council took huge courage and said, well, we'll partner with the YMCA. And so with this scheme, there are 11 homes, um, two of them are two bed, the nine one beds, there's a mix of young people from the YMCA that we're moving into them. 
uh, and then a number of people moving off the, the housing uh, waiting list in, in the city, which is, is large, as you'll imagine. And then the two two beds, the conversation we had was, but how do you create stable and vibrant community? And so we've, we've been recruiting um, and advertising the city for people to come in and be paying a rent. Uh, these houses will be at what's called social rent, 100% social rent. So it's, it's genuinely affordable. Um, and we wanted people, though, who would pay like a civic contract to serve and build community. And we've been recruiting what we call these community builders to live here and partner with, and I suppose mentor to some extent, some of those other young people who may be in difficult circumstances. So it's a huge experiment on both the kind of uh, housing site, but it's also in terms of creating community and creating places and creating constantly this opportunity for replication. As we discover things that are workable, how can they be scalable and start to answer the questions that we face? Um, and just one last example, um, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is a, so uh, what we also face in Bristol is a lot of um, uh, infill sites, garage sites, where uh, when large social housing projects were built, they also would have included lots of garages. A lot of those garages were built with asbestos, they fall into disrepair. They're a nightmare from a planning perspective. They're a nightmare often to get in and build, and yet modern methods mean that we can start to do that. So again, we're looking at a scheme here um, that we're about to start to, to put into planning. Um, where we can we can do that and, and again use really high levels of sustainability um, and, and this will be around probably around key workers and homes for heroes um, but that the beginning of this project has then led us to an opportunity to collaborate at wider scale so we we were working now with Innovate UK um, and through the council we, we uh, pitched for a project and we've now we're now partnering with a, a host of nine modular partners including some what I would call again any of you know this large volumetric players so these are homes that literally come uh, not as kit apart, but completely built onto site. Um, and that's people like Booklook, which is owned by Skanska and Ikea, um, LNG Modular, Toppat, those kind of organisations. And um, through this project now, we are looking to be delivering in, in Bristol about, uh, about 450 homes um, over the next couple of years. Uh, about 60% of those will be retained and owned by the council as affordable homes. And we'll be developing nine different methodologies to get the data on that. And again, the idea is that not only are we using these schemes to build new homes and talk about hope in housing and sustainable housing and, and building places, but also that we are working with the council to look at how we need to really think about system, um, the system design of how is housing happening in the city? Um, how does modern methods of construction where you're hitting procurement rules and legal rules and um, uh, you know, complex planning rules, how does the system need to, 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 to shift and pivot to enable um, you know, these things to happen because there's real barriers to this happening at a major scale in the UK at the moment. And we need this sort of think and do tank approach to kind of learn those lessons. And then the idea is we share that. And actually the system design element I think is interesting because we're also looking at a digital toolkit within this to, to break down complex information in the market for, for users to engage with it. So that's, that's kind of where we are at at the moment. That is, is the focus of our efforts. Um, and uh, we, we really are, our role is an enabler. So, so as the housing festival, we will never own any housing, we will never own any land, but we think there's something really important about this ability to run between these different silos, to, to, to create narrative where there's been a breakdown in relationship, to start to, to identify shared objectives and shared purpose and to, to build bridges. And I think that's often what is often difficult to ha make happen, but is a critical part of systems, innovation, building relationships and building trust. Um, and as part of that, just to finish, um, I just we, we we talk about our expo. We were hoping to do another big physical expo this year. Obviously, with COVID nineteen, we've had to rethink that. So we are hosting a, a virtual expo, um, ma mainly through Zoom, uh, hosting a whole series of events where we will start to really um, try to engage again this broader audience, um, but also share some of the lessons. Some of it will be very much aimed at industry. Some of it will be aimed. Um, explaining to the public why things have happened, why they've ended up where they are. Um, and, and within that as well, engaging with some of the SMEs and some of the community groups who are so critical at that front end of when, when housing and the developers move in, how do we ensure that that agency, that conversation, that trust is built? So, so we're, we're hosting a whole series of events and um, do have a look at our website if you'd be interested to join any of those. Um, I think that's what I'd say really, and, and just to finish that, one of the things we talk a lot about is this, this challenge, particularly when you're engaging at a sort of political level around how do we celebrate progress and not wait for perfection. Um, you know, there's a lot of learning to do along the way. Um, and, and 
it, it can be very difficult, particularly when you move into something like housing, where you're talking about, you know, uh, you, the, the homes we're building, we're talking about about 80 million pounds worth of investment, that, that it, it can become a bit of a, a stymie to getting things to be tested and learned. But there's something around this, this confidence and this uh, transparency about saying we need an R&D element of how we try new things across the city. And what we hope with the festival is that we're creating a, I suppose, an opportunity to do that with honesty, um, but to be very clear about our values, our objectives, and to share those and in invite other people to be participatory in the way that that's done across the city. So uh, website details there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jess. That's, I mean, I think we started this conversation uh, talking about what the role of a service designer really is. And I think you've, you've effectively given us a view of all the change one can think of affecting, irrespective of whether you're a service designer or not. So thank you for that. It's infectious, to say the least. Uh, I think also your view on um, things being done uh, being better than being perfect is, is, is a really important one. I think across the three, uh, across all three of you, I think what I've heard um, over and over again is there is no bad player. I think everyone wants to do the right thing, but everyone moves at different paces. And I think being the orchestrator is effectively what makes change happen. And to see the orchestration that you've all brought about to the work that you do uh, is truly inspiring. Um, I think for everyone here, I'm assuming you've got lots to take in, lots to digest. And if you're um, also the sort of service designer who's, who's so used to being in the digital world where you spent a credible amount of your time pushing pixels and wishing those pixels were perfect, uh, I think this is a really good moment for all of us, including myself, to step back and really think about uh, the scale at which one can operate, the scale at which you can affect change, but also what you, what all of us can't be scared of. And I think that proactive engagement is just uh, what all of this world really needs. So hopefully on that slightly um, uh, somber note, uh, I will hand over to Ava, who wanted to run a quick exercise with all of us. For all of you who don't want to be a part of this exercise, this is your moment to get a quick drink of water. And we'll be back in about five minutes, but over to you, Eva. Um, I'm actually going to start with a question that someone in the audience raised pretty much as we were uh, beginning to get into it. And I, I think it's important to ask this question because it came from you as opposed to me. So to start with, thank you, Annie, for this question. You asked, um, you were very curious to ask Nina uh, about how you, um, how do you actually know um, that you're, act, you're, you're helping those who are in most need of help uh, or those who can benefit most from your participatory projects? Um, and how do you ensure accessibility across those projects? Yeah, I think that's such a good question, Annie. Thanks for asking. Um, uh, and I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different ways in which I could answer it. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things and then I'd love to hear whether, whether you you, whether that answers your question or whether you have any follow-on questions. Um, but the, the Everyone Every Day initiative is built on um, about 10 years of um, research into these types of projects. And I think when we started, it was about seven or eight years. And so that's where some of the, where, that's where those design principles come from, for example. So just to say, we haven't plucked them out of uh, thin air, they, they are basically, uh, they're based on 10 years of experience of trying to do these projects and, and, and realizing that actually, you know, um, people aren't showing up because it's too far away from where they live or because they have, um, you know, preconceived notions about what it might take to participate or, or um, you know, because they might not have um, uh, money to participate or, you know, like a range of things which basically resulted in those inclusivity design principles. Um, but I also wanted to emphasize that we're, that as we're as we're um you know in development like we're not we're not a sort of like a finished design in terms of the initiative um we're constantly like developing and evaluating and, and figuring out how it's going so just to give you a very practical example of that in at the end of year two one of the things that we realized was that there was one inclusivity design or one design principle missing which was that we should at all times make children feel welcome because through a lot of the research that we did at the end of year two we figured out that actually um, 
for a lot of people, the fact that their children were, were welcome and that that was so clear and that that was so visible the moment that you, you know, see the spaces or that you enter them was a big reason that they felt enabled to come and that they, that they, you know, they wouldn't have childcare or anything. So they, they literally wouldn't have been able to come if that wouldn't have been the case. Um, and, you know, taking it one step further, we realize that children are in their own right, um, you know, actors in, in, that, in that ecosystem and they can actually be, play an active part in co-designing their, 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 the places that they live in just as much as their, as their parents um, can. Um, so just as a quick example of like, you know, part, it's partly built on a lot of the research that has been done, but then on the other hand, we're constantly developing it and adapting it if we are finding new things that need to be added to it. Um, and then I think another thing to highlight is that we, so we, so we do a lot of research, as I said, like the whole team is involved in doing that research and every year we, pr we produce a big report um, and we um, report on five things and um, inclusivity is one of them. And one of the things that we, for example, look at, look at is like, what's the distribution of residents across the borough um, mapped onto distributions or uh, the distribution of, or like the levels of deprivation across the borough. So that, that's another thing that we, for example, do. And that's also a conversation that we have with, um, with the council who are one of our most important partners to try and understand, are we reaching those people that you guys feel should really, you know, be able to, um, access and participate. Um, so those are sort of like two different dynamics in which we try and understand whether we're reaching, who we're reaching and, and, and whether we're reaching the people that we should be reaching. Um, even though, again, like I said, it, we want to try and reach everyone because we don't believe that, um, you know, just, just targeting people and having those people access certain activities will, will help them. It's really building relationships across the whole spectrum um, between people that normally wouldn't necessarily meet that really you know generate some of those those benefits and then the last thing I wanted to highlight is like um, so I've been running the co-production lab which for the for about two years looked at systemic integration um, and one of the projects that we ran was called the um, transition project and that specifically looked at like how do we need to work together with professional services in the borough to make sure that people who are experiencing very difficult situations whether they might be experiencing domestic violence or substance misuse issues or, um, you know, a range of things or, or living in temporary accommodation, like what, what, how do we need to work together? What, we, what do we need to do? In what ways can we integrate to make sure that those people can actually access um, the participation ecosystem as well? Um, like I said, I could talk about this for hours, but I think those three things sort of highlight some of the things that we do. But I also wanted to say, I think the question shouldn't be, how do we know for sure? Because we probably, we don't. But the question is like, what actions are we taking every single day to try and make sure that we're reaching people um, and reflect on whether we are reaching the people that we, that we should be reaching? That's really helpful framing actually. It also is a good segue into my next question to Jess. Um, what are the things that you find yourself demystify? You talked about demystification being a key component of the process of actually bringing people together. What are the what are the most significant things you found yourself demystified day on day um, over the course of this journey with Bristol? Yeah, I think I think what's been fascinating is you know when you get into really complex systems that 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 so many uh, people have their their element they're looking at. So so you know whether you're dealing with a council or you're dealing with a social housing provider or you're dealing with a, a construction company that. Um, you know, we've got these these huge complex systems where we've got specialists working on a particular element. And then when you try and um, shove an element of kind of innovation or collaboration through, uh, what can tend to happen is you're, it doesn't really sit anywhere because it's no one's responsibility to make that happen. Um, it, it might be that, it, you know, it's a, it's a strategic decision um, with, with the senior leadership, but will the senior leadership be cited on that? And so with what we found with, with modern methods of construction, where we're talking about not, not just a small tweak in the way that homes are built, but a, a kind of game changer around so many of the elements that are traditional and known and understood to make decisions are questioned and, um, and sort of put under quite a rigorous examination, have to be re-examined and rethought. And so who has time for that? And so a lot of the demystification is almost saying, can we come back to what we're trying to achieve? You know, are we trying to build um, uh, more homes? Are we trying to build more sustainable homes? Are, are we trying to address the fact that um, we need to think more inclusively, not just about how much something costs, but actually what the, the objective to that home is and what the value, the longer term value of that home is. So, yes, I can build you a, a home cheaper today, but actually if that's costing the environment and it's really expensive to live in, is that the right kind of 
So, so the, some of the demystification is almost bringing people back to that, that very first principle of what are the objectives that we're trying to build and what are those outcomes that we're trying to deliver and getting people to gather around that. And then you can then re-examine for them uh, where do they sit in that process. So some of that's the demystification. And, and then with the public, I think housing is so uh, contentious. And, um, you know, if I throw the word at you prefab, um, you know, post Second World War, a lot of a lot of London, a lot of big cities, we, we had this prefabricated housing that went up and, um, you know, we, we had a, a house boom in the in the UK because there was a real need to provide homes for the for the particularly for the men and, and, and the, the people coming back from war, etc. So we had a sort of social housing uh, really for the first, you know, well, it was after the First World War, again, after the Second World War. But a lot of that, a lot of those homes or some of those homes are really poor quality uh, and the word prefab. Um, is, is a problem because modern methods are often thought about being able to go back to prefabs. So some of the demystification is saying that the technology, the opportunity, the, the sustainability is fundamentally different. But, but you can't talk about that just as a concept. You've almost got to give people the ability to touch and feel it. They have to be able to see it. People are very sceptical. One of the problems I think we have in today's day and age is there's, there's a million versions of the truth. Uh, and so if you're just another noise shouting, without the ability for people to have the experience of seeing and touching and feeling, it's very difficult to create that credible conversation to build trust. So, so I think some of the demystification is going back to first principles and then some yeah. of it is around the social organization. Okay. That's really helpful to understand your framing of it. I've got, I can see questions coming in. Katie, yeah. I may take this one right after the one I'm about to ask, if that's all right. Um, I think Jez raises an interesting point around um, a certain, um, concern around things that we don't understand and therefore a concern around putting um, uh, putting our money on something that is where you don't want to be the first mover. On the other hand, you start seeing rigid behaviors when it comes to people and places. And you know, you begin to see technology can change fast, but people don't. And I think I'm really curious to know, Liam, I'd known about your story of, um, you know, effectively all that you did for the marketplace. What I hadn't known was um, your experience of bringing Square in. I'd love to know a little more about how you actually went about convincing Square to partner up, but also how you went about engaging with those who ran stalls within the market to incentivize them even before monetary incentivization set in. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess the, the thing that happened with Square, um, in a way, I, it sounds crazy, but it was kind of the easiest part of the project. Um, for me, uh, obviously the kind of, the most of part of Darwin involved me doing a lot of kind of hard work, doing workshops, going back and forth between London and Darwin and things like that. Um, I was very lucky that with Square, that they were actually really reactive uh, to me getting in touch with them. And at the time, I think they were, at, they were actually quite a small team within the UK. And now that now they're one of the biggest players in the kind of, um, the card payments um, industry in the UK. Um, but at the time they were quite new to it. And I think they'd actually done something similar in a town in Wales. Um, so uh, I'd heard about that and uh, got in touch with them, um, agreed to have uh, a meeting and they kind of agreed straight away. Um, it's obviously good PR for them as well. Um, there's kind of no denying that. Um, in terms of the discussions that I had with uh, market traders i think a lot of them kind of already knew that they maybe should have started been taking card payments but i think you know a lot of the people in the market especially had been there for quite a long time um and were kind of um a little bit unsure about the technology um typically normal card payments uh, services are quite expensive um but the way that square works is a little bit different uh, so that if you're small if you're a small business it can be quite affordable um, and I think what it actually took was creating some kind of ambassadors within the market who went, who, who took the step first. So we had kind of um, a, a vintage sweet shop who, who started first, um, followed by kind of uh, a bacon stall. Um, and uh, they started to kind of act as advocates really. And so when I wasn't around or when someone from Square wasn't around, uh, they were really helpfully um, able to be in a position where um, where they could support those other traders or those, those other businesses with when they were struggling with it a little bit. Um, 
so yeah i think but then for me uh, it was a matter of just kind of connecting the right people uh and i and then i could sit back and, and watch it happen really <laughs> It's amazing when that magic begins to happen, isn't it? <laughs> yes. um, I can see Rob's asked a question about what happens when the magic doesn't happen and what becomes the role of effectively anyone involved in the, in the world of making places better. Um, what happens when we have to start distributing um, power across to make sure that every stakeholder feels like this process of effectively making a place better is an equitable process to start with. Uh, Rob, I've, I've tried to reframe your question and I'm going to open that up to all three speakers for today. Um, so up to you for who, who hits unmute first. I, I'm just trying to, I think it's a great question, isn't it? I, I think, I, I, and there's another question around this thing of trust as well, which are, are around how do you build trust, which I think, it, you know, particularly when you're not from those communities. I think for us, um, we've come at this from a position of how can we be an enabler to try and to try and enable, enable those problems so so we are i suppose almost agnostic um in that in that we um we don't own the land uh, we we're not the developer we, we don't own the the technology and so what we hope we can do is is, is try and act as an agent to to, to 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 try and enable those conversations to happen the truth is how long does it take to build trust is a difficult one because there's there's so much cynicism and disappointment um, and anger, uh, again, we're sitting there of housing. But, but in terms of those bottlenecks, how do you make it more equitable? I'll give you one example. I think that um, it, when it came to one of the larger schemes that work on in Bristol, about 200 homes, we've, we've really tried to um, get involved with the, at the community level. So we've gone to the sort of the local plan consultation. We've gone to the um, uh, the, the sort of the, the times when there's been presentations of the community consultation and we've we've tried to then and I say this carefully but I think hold hold the other parties to account on what they've said because a lot of the disappointment comes when promises are made and then they're not delivered um, and so what we try and do is say look these are the shared objectives we've agreed these are the objectives that you as the community have been consulted on and talked about can we try and um, create some of that agency for you because we're involved in the conversation on a day-to-day -day level and then report back to you on if those things don't happen why has it not happened um, rather than just it sort of just happening and then everyone walking away and being frustrated yes. so, so it's I think you know obviously different scenarios different challenges but for us that's a big part of it is the broad communication transparency um, and trying to mitigate the kind of the anger and disappointment that happens if, if people don't feel they've got any agency or their voices aren't heard just, just one final thing on that, you know, consultation often means you can go to a group of people and say, you know, let's dream together what you'd like. And, you know, I'm sure most people would say, yeah, I'll have a swimming pool in my house. But, but you know, there's, how do we create around this the reality check of, of, um, of, of we can't all get all of everyone's desires met at once, but what we need to do is work out what those priorities are and the best use of that resource is. And it may mean that we need a conversation with some people that says, we're really sorry, we know you're going to be disappointed but these are the objectives we agree, these are the objectives your community has engaged in. Uh, and it doesn't mean everybody can just go, yeah, absolutely, I've got everything I wanted. And, and that creates conflict and disappointment, but I think it's also how that conversation is mitigated and managed is important. That's a, that's a very worthy point. I think I've always, um, I've always been very cynical of, uh, in the service design community of our focus on the user and the consumer and their needs. I've always, I've, I've always felt like you don't have to give the user everything they want. You have to understand what they want. Then you still have to do what works to be able to move things forward for the user to be better off. Yeah. You don't have to give them what they want. And I think there's, there's something interesting there when you start looking at a system as complex as a city because you can never build a city for everyone. Yeah. But you, you can always build a city in the best interests of yeah. those who, who definitely need to be looked after. And, and the most looked after in certain circumstances. Um, I'm curious to know, Nina and Liam, your, your view of uh, this whole process of effectively making the process itself equitable. What does it feel like, Liam, in your opinion, with the catapult, you represent in some ways the innovation cell of the government. Yeah. You are a stakeholder that has a side. How does that pan out? Uh, so I did. I had an answer prepared from a heart of Darwin perspective. So maybe I'll start with that whilst I think about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it can kind of apply to both. It's kind of about um, 
it's about removing barriers um, and removing that hierarchy that's in place. So kind of going back to kind of what we did in Heart of Dolan, I think getting, uh, getting those people uh, all in the same room, whether you're the, you're the million pound, uh, you're, the, you're the millionaire who has the money towards a project or you're um, the old lady who lives down the road, you know, getting those people in the same room and finding ways as a facilitator to remove that, um, that hierarchy is, is really important. But also I think um, for those uh, organizations like councils or um, developers, I think it's important to show vulnerable, vulnerability and admit to your mistakes as well. Um, and I think as long as you're open with, within your whole process uh, and, you know, and you don't do one workshop and then take everything and hide it away and then have a bunch of rich white men in a uh, meeting room make a decision. Um, I think that as long as you're open and you continue that process of involving people throughout, then, you know, you build empathy. Uh, and I think that that can go a long way. How about you, Nina? Um, yeah, I think it's such a good question. Um, I, yeah, for, for us, I think a lot of it is in the design of the support platform and things like the like the design principles around the project. So they they are all about making sure that um, you know power is distributed in a way like everything happens on equal footing and there's not someone who's the expert teaching everyone else things or you know given those for example design principles it shouldn't matter whether you have money or resources anyone can access all of any of the projects but obviously that doesn't mean that it's not difficult or that doesn't mean that some people you know don't have like more confidence or more um, you know different ways of sort of like taking up a lot of space and so I think a lot of it as well as in in those project designers um, and their their ability to build those relationships and to facilitate those um, conversations and to facilitate those co-design processes that happen in the shops and to make sure that people are all heard and have a have a have a say in what the projects could look like um, I think two things spring to mind two situations in which has been really difficult. So for example, um, with the collaborative business programs, which is really about bringing groups of people together who are willing to learn from each other and to um, operate on their collective brand. And, you know, it's about testing, testing an idea that you might have and really getting all of the support that you might need in order to really prototype that and then test trade it. Um, one of the tensions that we've really seen is that sometimes people who have incredible skills, want to join those, you know, collaborative business programs, just like, for example, with the, with the pantry one of, or, or maybe another one around fresh food. I don't remember. I remember there was this, this, this um, woman and she was an incredible cake baker and she was just re like, she really in the end didn't get along because she did, she couldn't see how she could get anything out of that group process on an equal footing. And for her, it was all about wanting to give back in a very voluntary type matter to the community that she saw as more needy than herself, basically. And I think, so for the collaborative business programs, one of the big lessons that we've had is that we really need to communicate and, and make this idea of like operating on a peer-to-peer -peer level and being open to learning from each other and being open to share. And that that's where the value is to be had. The value is not to be had from your secret recipe that's amazing or from your incredible cake baking skills. Like those are interesting things and they're, they're really valuable if you're up for sharing them, but they're only valuable if you're willing to learn as well. Um, so that was one example that sprang to mind where we, where it was really, really tricky at some point and we've had to facilitate certain conversations. Um, but then for example, it also, you know, really, really focusing on that and facilitating those conversations resulted in <clears throat> another group deciding that they were going to redistribute some of the money that they made of, of test trading on markets um, to be, um, given to people who, who who were very unsuccessful in their test trading and so that was such a nice thing to see that actually the group itself decided that they wanted to re redistribute some of the some of the money that they made through that pro process um and so that was the first thing that came to mind i forgot about the second one i think mm. um yeah, I can't remember. I had a second one. That's all right. Oh, when it comes back, we'll, we'll come back to it. We won't put you under the spot. Um, I think it's interesting how you all frame it. I've been, I've been furiously scribbling notes as we are going. Um, I think one of the things that all of you talk about is uh, 
effectively, you know, how you how you make sure that you are spreading that sense of ownership, but also bringing the right people along at the right points in time, and being the facilitators of change. Um, we're also working, you know, walking into a world where the climate crisis looms. There's a whole lot of decisions to be made around what forms of cities do we want to live in. And it's very easy to create more. So um, how do you spend time thinking about a means of prioritization for more sustainable impact uh, on the work that you do? And how do you consider um, the paradigms of growth when you start a new project? What does growth really mean in the world that you operate in? And what form of growth do you aspire for? I, th I think that's I think that's a great question, and and let me just be a bit contentious, if I may. You know, one of the one of the biggest challenges with climate crisis is um, that it can become the preserve of middle class to fix it. Because if you are genuinely in the poorer part of society, you can't afford literally to worry about climate crisis. You aren't thinking about shopping sustainably or, or feeding your kids organic food, and and so one of the biggest opportunities i suppose around how we start to really tackle climate crisis is changing people's behavior and allowing them to make a, 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 you know decisions that are more responsible towards the planet and so um you know i'm all for climate extinction rebellion and all these things they're really important but we the one of the biggest problems is you know this lack of equality um and equity that people have to make decisions because of their of their financial status so for me growth would look like more people living in uh, resilient and healthy communities where they can start to be active responsible citizens because they're enabled and equipped to do that um, and then they can engage responsibly and they're also being home homed in, in houses themselves that are a much more uh, responsible you know use of resource because they're energy efficient the rest of it I mean some of the homes we can build now they can nine months out of the year use no energy and even provide surplus energy that we have the technology but we we have to decide what we're prepared to pay for as a society so for me a, a growth element really of that is how do we bring more people into that that sense of um creating a greater equality um inclusive growth so that people can make those responsible decisions in terms of the climate that's yeah i think the the idea around resilience is an interesting one to seed into it i'm curious nina in, the, in terms of some of the work you see yourself do through participatory cities um, when it comes to resilience but when it also comes to sustenance of some of the projects that participatory city creates what are some of the things that you have found yourselves put in place to make sure that the outcomes of these projects are as resilient and sustainable as they can be um, I, yeah I think that's a really good question and that's a journey that we're on um, I think it's related to Liam's question about how we're funded and what happens if the funding stops. But um, at the moment, we, we're funded through, through five, five or six funders um, over a five-year period, um, and you know the council is one of one of our funders as well, and that makes them a really important partner. And I think one of one of the things that we're thinking about is how this how the funding can continue after that, and and what it might look like in terms of how the how the platform can be sustained. Because one of the things that we believe is that we do need the platform for this ecosystem to be sort of like to be maintained and, and to grow because quite often um, without the support structures, people might drop out of projects and then not have, have an easy way in. Um, and I think, yeah, I think some of the ways, so I guess for us, the, the biggest question in terms of, um, I forgot the word that you use, like sustainability or um, continuation is thinking about how we continue that support platform, ra platform rather than those individual projects because quite often people swap between projects or they set up something they build something and then they you know they might continue to do something else afterwards and I say so I think for us the biggest question is how do we what can we do to make that support platform sustainable in the long run rather than just those individual projects um, and and then again I think for those for some of the projects like the collaborative business programs we're thinking about how can we help people set up cooperatives that they can actually then run and own themselves um, as a as you know as some of, as a, as a possible result of those programs um, again with no pressure on anyone to have to end, end up there or you know yeah. um, 
so yeah, I think those are for two example ways in which we're thinking about that. But I think, yeah, it's interesting to make that point or, or like to point out a difference between trying to find a way to continue that support platform rather than um, the focus only being on those projects, if that makes sense. Yeah. Liam, I think um, to, to reframe that question, particularly in your context, I, I realize you haven't uh, engaged uh, with Heart of Darwin in the last few years, so it would be unfair to ask you this question in relation to that. But you brought up the, the very interesting uh, conversation around funding. I, I think I heard it about five times around when you were talking. Um, from, from looking for funding uh, as a student, which is incredible to think about, to where you are today, what role does funding play in some of the projects um, that you engage on? And how do you, uh, how does one measure the, um, the resilience of a project to be able to qualify for a fund, uh, to, to be able to elaborate to a funder that you're doing the right thing in order to drive it forward? Sorry, could you repeat that last bit? Uh, how do you how do you how do you measure the success of your project so that funders understand that you're you're putting your work towards, I guess, sustainable and equitable futures for everyone? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, funding is uh, a big thing. So, like, uh, first of all, from Heart of Darwin perspective, uh, yes, as a student, like, it was quite difficult. Um, I think. Uh, I did most of it on a voluntary basis. Uh, the council paid for kind of certain expenses, like the cost of the website. Uh, and then I was able to get funding for the London trip, which was great. Um, but um, in terms of like taking it any further than that, which is one of the reasons why it stopped, um, it's, I think when you're in there as a student, it's kind of hard to get them to take you seriously. So as soon as you ask to get paid, um, it's a little bit more confusing. Um, from a catapult perspective, um, so we're in quite a unique position as a catapult. So we're part government funded. Um, and so we kind of, uh, most of our income comes from a variety of internal projects, uh, commercial projects and R and D funded projects, um, that, um, are on kind of a, a big variety of scales. So that might be kind of big European projects like the one I spoke to you about. Um, we also work directly with the government, uh, and organizations like Network Mail. Uh, we also work with SMEs to help them test the new technologies. Um, and we also work directly with councils across the UK, uh, helping them to identify and solve their grand challenges. Um, I guess, um, going back to your question about how we measure the success of, of our, uh, going back to kind of our funders, which is kind of primarily Innovate UK. Um, I'm maybe not the best person to answer that actually. That's fine. Um, but we do have a, we also have an impact assessment team whose okay. role is to work on um, kind of measuring that impact in projects. Uh, and we also have a series of KPIs uh, and a strategy, strategy that we work towards. Um, I think it's actually really interesting. I've been having quite a lot of discussions about this kind of thing recently around uh, test, beds, uh, test beds and pilots and uh, kind, of, kind of related to what Jess has been talking about in terms of trying out new products. Um, so maybe I can actually reframe uh, this as a question towards Jess actually as well is, um, let me just find my notes where I asked that. <laughs> so uh, I guess what are the biggest barriers to rolling out these modern methods of uh, building homes nationwide? So, um, you know, we see a lot of the, we've seen quite a lot of these kind of different ways of of creating houses and what I've heard, um, I did a, a round table today about test beds and we heard that kind of one of the biggest challenges is around uh, rolling it out beyond that test bed. Um, so uh, beyond those kind of red brick copy and pasted houses, uh, you know, how do we get over that? What's, what, how do we roll out? Yeah, and I think actually that's where you get much more aligned to the service design question because um, what what you what you tend to find is we people who work in this area we can all recite what the barriers to entry are so it's around it's the way the money works so if you if you're in insurance um, we, uh, warranties legal frameworks procurement rules um, there's a whole series of kind of barriers where MMC modern methods um, they they ask novel questions because it's novel um, uh, and we know what they are but you've got sort of national drivers in terms of policy and that's interesting but of course you then very quickly if you think about national policy these all have to go through a local planning authority 
And so you have to then engage in, the, in a local authority and lo a local place. And of course, that's then political. Um, so how do you then engage communities and, and create, uh, move from inertia to movement? Uh, and it, what's the risk? So then you, you've got political risk and jeopardy. So, so, so there's, there's the complexity of that. And I suppose, therefore, to answer your question, how do you, do you move from uh, lots of different pilots happening to creating something around a system? Uh, it seems to me that you you really have to engage in understanding what the barriers are within a local authority and, and, and why in a local authority you can't just sort of turn the machine on and get houses coming out the end. Um, and so that is working. It, you know, uh, my experience working with Bristol City Council is there's there's a lot of appetite to want to engage, but you're you're really dealing with diff 10 different organisations. So you've got the highways department and you've got the uh, and they've got their issues and their policy issues and you've got the planning which is a quasi judicial element which is separate then you've got the the politics and the policy and then you've got the the enabling team and the procurement team and the legal team and they've each got their own responsibility and and how do you start to um sequence the decision making that needs to take place how do you get political alignment but then actually what does mmc what do these new innovations do that mean you need to resequence some of that decision making all of that takes time all of that and, and what tends to happen is you you get one system thing you get it working and you push it through and everyone goes great we did it can we get back to how we always did it because that was a nightmare um and so i think what we're trying to do is say look that learning um has to be scalable it has to be replicable so we can't just cheat the system we can't just sort of smash it through and go we got we got to think about a way of enabling the system to evolve and improve and then sharing that learning so um, and I think a lot of that, if I'm honest, is, is about national policy aligning with local authorities and local places to help them do it, because it, it can't be done just in a national, from a national perspective. It can be supported and enabled, but we often talk about that policy gap. You know, government will announce funding over here, but why is it not making change on the ground? And that is because there's a stretch of resources, there's a stretch of confidence, there's the innovation challenge let alone the problem that, 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 that you're talking about, a lot of complex mechanisms. So that service design element to me is around how can you start to sequence all of that? How can you get um, those people talking and, and, and making those conduits work more effective? How does the digital element of that start to simplify um, really complex data uh, around a market that is evolving and moving? So it's very hard to put a pin in it and say that's the right thing for us to do because by the time you've made a decision, technology has moved on again. So, so I think that's sort of the, that, that's almost the question that we're, we're posing ourselves. And it's, I wish there was a straightforward answer, but I think the ambition we've got is by putting nine through, through the system and one local authority, it's not looking at them as nine, nine pilots. It's actually looking at how you use those nine to pilot the system change that you need to then support the next lot coming through. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Yeah, thanks, Jess. And can I just answer one other bit that struck me that's really important? We talked a bit about agency and how we engage those that don't engage. And from a city level, I think what's interesting, take the planning system. Um, if we're putting a planning consent in or, or a developer's putting a planning consent in, if you, if you turned up, which many of you may not have had the joy of, a planning committee, what you tend to find is that you've got people there who have a vested interest in stopping the development because it's near them. They don't want social... And good reasons. I'm not suggesting that they're being... Uh, always cynical and, and, and unworthy. There may be very worthy reasons. Um, but who advocates on behalf of the, the homeless? Who advocates on behalf of those families in emergency accommodation? Who advocates on those people that have, uh, you know, as a family been living in an apartment for four years with no outside space and now COVID-19 has exacerbated their asthma or whatever else. And that's one of the problems around the advocacy element of our, of our housing system. And so some of the system design is kind of I, I suppose the equity of this is we have to look at the compromise about who the people that need um, to be identified and supported. And it can't just be those that already have equity in stake get to dictate uh, and shape the future. And I think that's, that's a really difficult conversation to have at a city scale. And probably the, the problem with that is, from a, again, from a service design, is it has to therefore work at both the community level and that broader strategic city level and that is complex but it's it's well digital can help with that absolutely i think there's a, there's something to be said about that voice in the room as you as you mentioned it another to be said about the power of data that the government holds about things that that the government would like to try and understand whereas there's something to be said about data that private the private sector holds and i think um, data can play a uh, Depending on who's who's crunching that data and what the biases in, in collecting the data uh, may be, 
you begin to see different layers of information that can begin to hopefully move us to a more equitable future. Um, I'm, I've been trying to look at all the comments and the questions you've been um, sending us. I realize Pooja, Rochelle, and Rob, and Sadaf, you had a few other questions. I'm going to try and cover some of them, and I'm hoping some of this conversation has covered some of the questions we've asked the speakers. But I did promise the speakers that to close the panel, which I'm going to have to do pretty much in the next two or five minutes, I'd let them ask each other a question. Liam's already had his turn, so he doesn't get this one. Yeah. Uh, Nina, would you like to go next? Do you have a question for either Liam or Jess? Jess, I really like what you, what you just said about um, it, the fact that this needs to work on several levels for it to have any meaningful impact and to view those nine pilots as like, as actually pilots of a system change rather than just those pilots for those houses. And I was just wondering, I guess something that I've been curious about, because I've, I've been working on systemic integration between us and, and sort of the, the council, for example, and other professional organizations in the borough, and that isn't always easy. Um, and some people are more interested in that than others. And, um, and sort of like one of the things that, that, you know, that I, that I wonder about is like, for that to work, you need to have people with time and commitment on all of those different levels as well. And have, have you been able to achieve that to an extent where you feel like you have a chance at piloting that system change? And if so, how did you achieve that? Yeah, um, I, I think we've got a chance. And, and you know, as, as we all will you know, be sympathetic, we're, we're trying to create stakeholder engagement, but we don't hold, we have some levers to pull, but we ultimately, it won't be our decision what works and what doesn't work. Um, I, I think what's interesting, you know, is, is this sort of invitation we all have, I suppose, to as people with relational capital. Um, it's interesting with Liam's story, you know, there's, there's relational capital, there's a, there's a sense of maybe civic responsibility, you get involved in things. And, 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 and that was where this started for me. And I think that through my professional work, I connected with quite a few, I suppose, senior people in the city um, and, and got to know our, our elected mayor professionally and was very impressed by his, I suppose, political mandate. Um, and it's not about party politics for me, it's about this, the human politics of this. Uh, and so I, I suppose I, I took the decision that I had some responsibility as a, as a stakeholder to offer my time and my resource um, with the hope that rather than talking about it, I mean, I, you know, again, it was interesting reflecting on Liam that, you know, ideas, we can all have good ideas. Um, and, and I, but, but what do you then do to sort of take responsibility to see that through? So I spent two years working on sort of setting up this notion of a festival, going around the city, trying to build consensus, trying to build interest. And lots of people, that's a great idea, but it's never going to happen. Um, and that was costly. I mean, legitimately costly. I mean, the irony for us is that we've kind of, as a family, put our housing deposit into the city to try and build houses for the city. And I, I don't say that with any sense of um, regret because I love what I do and I'm very passionate about it. But I think sometimes there is a, there's a price to pay to be blunt to create space for those conversations because the bit we're talking about is very, very difficult to fund. Um, it's very easy to talk about these ideas, but when you're talking about people with so little resource and, and people in local authorities, people in community organizations, very stretched, very stretched and, and austerity hasn't helped with that. So I think for us, there was a kind of, how can we provide um, the capacity to, to allow those conversations to happen? And then when you scan forward from that, what then happens is you can get something moving. You can get something to look like something. You can get something that starts to, uh, move from just being a concept to, to a bit more reality and then of course what, what we've now done which has been you know a lot of work but I'm really relieved with the Innovate UK funding we've brought resource into the council to actually pay for some of the resourcing of that system thinking um, and building the bridges between those different silos so one of the big barriers was you know legitimately with the, with the council was we just don't have time to look at this we like it we don't have time to look at it well you know, we've now, it's not the only barrier, there's many others, but, but it was really important to be able to come back to the council. Well, look, there's funding here that you've now secured to provide resource into tackling those questions. Um, so I don't know if that answers that question, but I suppose there's, the, there's often a gap between good idea, creating space and resource, and something that has to sort of step in. And sometimes that can be a benevolent funder, sometimes that can be just the luck of the, or everything aligns and there's an opportunity, but there's, 
there's somebody somewhere, someone's got to pay a price to get that thing moving. And whether that's an individual or a corporation or a community group or some incredibly well-connected individuals or just, you know, a lottery winner, whoever knows, I think that's the reality. Good ideas don't just become rea reality by sitting in a room and talking about them. Um, I wish they did. So, um, so I, and, and I think that's then, you know, it moves and that's what we've then been able to do is secure some funding for that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, and, and I was going to ask, uh, just to finish for Liam, um, Liam, what, you know, I, I, I just really challenged by, you know, you were a student, you, you, you had a connection with a place. Um, and I'm always impressed when people go from an idea to basically spending a, a lot of time and effort and energy in, in, in taking something with all of the pain of that. And actually, you know, one of the things I find quite fascinating is when you try to help, how many people are actually really offended that you're trying to help um because they think you're doing it the wrong way or whatever but how what was the what was the moment for you when you went from this isn't okay and i'm going to be the one who's going to step in what 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 because we can all be critical observers um but you move from being an observer to a player what 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 was the motivation what was the then i imagine there was a moment you went i'm not just watching this happen I'm, and i'd love to know just a bit about that personal story if you can just say what it was that, that sort of forced your hand somewhat yeah, definitely. Um, I think that the project itself was, uh, as much as I kind of look back on it now fondly, uh, for a good while, I kind of hated that project. Um, I think uh, as much as uh, it gave me butterflies, it also kind of broke my heart at numerous times. Uh, and that's where a lot of my learnings came from. Uh, for example, one day in university, um, the, the woman who's in the video actually, who says that we need advertising, 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 uh, I'd been like speaking to her as part of my research and um, I only found out that the demolition was going ahead when I, um, when I went to present that piece of work at university. So it actually started off as a photography project, um, which then turned into me speaking to people and finding about these challenges. And it was, uh, it was on the day of my presentation at university where I found out that um, the council wanted to demolish it. And then the next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call from this lady uh, accusing me directly, shouting down the phone to me. She wouldn't let me speak saying, you are responsible for the demolition of this market. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. Um, and at that point, I don't even think I'd had a conversation with the council. So um, that was, that was a hard one to take um, quite early on in the, in the project as well. Um, and, you know, like still even later on, um, even though we, I tried as hard as I could to kind of reach out to as many people as I could, you know, even now you still get people saying, Oh, I didn't hear about this. Uh, Oh, I, I, oh, I'd love to have had my say in this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really difficult. Um, and yeah, sometimes I wonder why I, uh, why I did it. Um, I think, um, I came out of university having done this project, um, and I was really happy about it. Um, and uh, I did a few talks about it. I was really um, proud of it. Um, and then I actually, um, it, it basically helped me to get my job at the Catapult. Uh, before that point, I didn't really call myself a service designer. I was a graphic designer until um, I spoke to a friend about the project and they were like, dude, this is service design. So um, it helped me to get my job at the Catapult. Um, and then when I started there, surrounded by uh, incredibly, uh, talented people um i went from up here in my level of confidence to down here in my level of confidence um and my manager uh, assures me that this happens to a lot of people when they come out of university i went from thinking i knew everything to realizing that i knew nothing which is why it's been quite nice today to be able to look back on it for the first time in a while and actually like think about some learnings what have i learned since um and that kind of thing but yeah it's it's completely driven by passion and i'm still it's it's a little bit like an addiction. I'm still trying to recreate it. I'm still trying to find opportunities to do something else. So when you find a market that's being demolished next, <laughs> please call all of us on this screen and everyone else on this call. I can see why there'll be lots and lots of supporters for the cause and for doing the right things, right? I think we, we spend a lot of time doing the things that need to be done. And I think doing the right thing is just so much more infectious. Uh, on that very poignant note that you've left us with, um, Liam, thank you so much for helping all of us realize that a whole bunch of us sat in here in a service design fringe festival are imposters. 
we all landed up in service design uh, having having done other things in our lives i can say that for myself definitely um and i think um what's interesting to know is that you know i think these problems can be solved by not being a service designer and i think that's the more the more important and the more interesting thing i think uh, we can be other forms of imposters and i'm looking forward to the kinds of way to come um thank you everyone thank you so much for joining this has been really fun